Hello and welcome back to the Long Live Rock and Roll podcast. Jerry Lee Lewis revolutionised rock and roll. He made the piano a lead instrument, fused genres, delivered high energy performances and defied social norms with his image. Having influenced future artists and genres to such an extent, we take a look at his iconic Great Balls of Fire and a handful of his other hits which undoubtedly helped shape, innovate and pioneer the rebellious spirit of rock and roll. Joining me to discuss Jerry Lee Lewis is my co-host, Mr. Felipe Amarin. How are you doing, bro? Doing great, man. I hope good. you're doing fine too. Yeah, good. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, for new listeners or viewers, please, the terms and conditions, as we like to call them. Uh, if you're on YouTube, make sure you give us a like and a subscribe so you stay up to date with our content. And if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, whether you're new or an old listener, I don't mean age, I mean in terms of how long you've been listening to us, make sure you scroll down and give us a little review. Anything, 20 seconds of your time really helps us out. A good review sends us straight up the charts and gets to us to be seen by more people. So we'd really appreciate it. Anyway, Jerry Lee Lewis. Yes. You watched the biopic, didn't you? Oh, it's not biopic. It's actually a movie, isn't it? It's a movie. It's a Hollywood movie. Um, proper one, like uh, Great Balls of Fire. I think it wasn't like a hit when it was released, uh, but it's a well done movie. Uh, Dennis Quaid plays uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, and he does a phenomenal job. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis like, didn't like the movie, but liked him. Uh, <laughs> That's and, always a good uh, sign, I think. Yeah, exactly. And, so and, even and, if the movie was directed badly, you got me right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Of course, he wouldn't like the movie. It doesn't, it doesn't show him as, as a nice person, right? Yeah. So uh, the, the, the other thing is... Uh, uh, he re-recorded the tracks for the movie, so it's like uh, uh, so all his hits you can find the original versions on Spotify and or whatever platform you're using. But you yeah. can also find the 1989 uh, record re-recordings by Jerry Lee Lewis himself, uh, and it's it's they're really good actually. And we'll just touch on that for a second because if you whether you're on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple, if you go down into the show notes, you'll see an episode playlist which we create each week for a new episode, and it has all the songs we mention. You know, this is an artist episode, but if we do an album, it'll have all the songs from an album plus any we mention. Now, because we're doing a kind of overview of Jerry Lee Lewis, a little look and dive into his career, we've actually put in the soundtrack for the movie because it contains most of his hits. Now, although these are re-recorded, you're going to see the sound soundtrack for the movie, all the songs he wrote, all of his hits that were re-recorded for the movie. And on top of that, I've put the originals below. So all the songs we're going to talk about, the characteristics, the stylistic, you know, genres are in it. That'll all be in the playlist for you to listen to along with this podcast. So um, just kick off with a bit, little bit of background about Jerry Lee Lewis. He was born uh, late September in 1935 in Faraday, Louisiana, and died at a decent age of 87 uh, at the end of October 2022. I actually remember when he died and the news came out. Geez, a couple of years yeah, ago, I remember wasn't that. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he began playing piano at a very young age, which is quite funny, isn't it? Because that's what we've always seen with these rock and roll pioneers. Fats Domino, you know, um, Elvis, uh, Buddy... Um, uh, oh god, I've forgotten. It. Oh my god, Chuck Berry. How did I forget that? Chuck Berry with a guitar at a young age. Yeah. It shows that their influence comes early, doesn't it? Yeah. And especially, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis. He was influenced through the radio. His family uh, enjoyed music, and he went to quite a lot of local music venues. Um, his first public performance was in 1949, and he's actually got a couple of famous family members. Um, maybe not for the right reasons, especially this TV evangelist. Um, oh, so, right. yeah, Jimmy Swaggart is, uh, I believe it's an uncle of his, um, who was a TV evangelist, and Mickey Gilly was a country singer. All right. So he's got a bit so, of a musical family, a bit of a famous family. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but this is a really funny story, that before we move on to his career, I want to tell you this. Did you know that his mother enrolled him into a Bible Institute in Texas. I would imagine, so I didn't know it was exactly that. <laughs> he was enrolled in a Bible Institute, but they kicked him out because when they were doing the songs, they did the song, My God is Real, and he did a boogie woogie version of it. <laughs> and they kicked him out. They're like, there ain't yeah. no place for this boogie woogie in this institute. <laughs> Um, sorry Amazing. for that poor Texan accent. Um, uh, but well, yeah, if you so watch the movie, there's a lot of his uh, uh, kind of conflicts with his cousin because they, they they were like at least in the movie they portrayed as almost like brothers. They grew up together, and his cousin was going down the path of the church and all the stuff, and he was playing rock and roll. And his cousin was always telling him that's the you know the the devil's music. You shouldn't play that. You shouldn't uh, be doing this. There you go. And yeah. 
Well, just uh, three more dates. 1952, we got the first ever Jerry Lee Lewis demo. 1956, he went to Nashville to audition for Sun Studios, where we know, you know, that's where Elvis was essentially born. Um, and 1957, we got Great Balls of Fire. So I think because of the nature of this episode, that's where we're going to have to start. Let's talk about Great Balls of Fire, man. You, you uh, kick off. What a song, right? That, that song has got um, every single... Uh, uh, essential, uh, I don't know, characteristics of his playing and his singing. Yeah. So that is Jerry Lee Lewis in a nutshell. He recorded songs by loads of different songwriters and he record, recorded, re-recorded songs that were already classics. But that's his own classic. That's his number one hit. That is the uh, the song that knocked Elvis to second place, you know, down to second place on the charts. So that is that's that's a hell of an achievement, isn't it? It is, yeah. I mean, the the thing that stands out to me, and I think to most people straight away, is the piano and the use of a piano in this song. Yeah. Because it was so different for the time. The the, the piano was a background instrument in in the fifties. You know, where where the vocals were the primary. I mean, I suppose the vocals still are the primary thing here, but rock and roll was very guitar driven. Yeah. wasn't it in the early 50s you know they're just learning to use the electric guitar and just sort yeah. of really escaping, you know, being a bit rebellious with this electric guitar twangy sound coming through an amp for jerry lee lewis to just sort of out of nowhere say well actually i don't play the guitar i play the piano and here's what yeah. i'm going to give you yeah exactly and also yeah yeah uh um also apparently the labels were looking for more guitar players or, or people who could sing and play guitar so you had elvis playing the acoustic guitar you had chuck berry playing those amazing solos on with an electric guitar and then he, Jerry Lee Lewis comes with his piano but playing almost like he's in like a Eddie Van Halen of the piano isn't it it's like it's like it's the thing with his piano playing is it's it's not uh how can I put it it's not clean it's not nice it's not like it, it's it's chaotic it's yeah. wild and it's completely over the top aggressive but it works yeah <laughs> you know? I mean, it was a completely innovative approach to it, wasn't yeah. it? You know, driving, yeah. the, the piano was the driving force of the song. You know, although you yeah. had the kind of rhythm section in the bass and occasionally some drums in his other work, the piano was the driving factor, creating and I, a really I, and I would say, energetic sound. Yeah, I would say, although the solos are amazing and everything, but his left hand, the bass lines it does on the piano, is so strong and like... Uh, uh, and so important to the groove in the song. Yeah, uh, for sure. And it's really cool, you know. I, I love the for the version. I mean, there's many versions of this song, and the yeah. one I've listened to that is in the playlist, not the one from the soundtrack, but the other one, the solo at the end. I call it a solo. It's just one note. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's just hammering that one note, isn't it? Yeah. And it just goes on. And you, but, but I don't want it to stop. I don't want it to stop. Yeah. I'm like, please yeah. give me more of that. Um, but yeah, complementing that incredible, uh, incredibly innovative and aggressive piano we have his vocals which kind of almost do the same thing don't they it's a bit it's very wild it's quite breathy it's very intense and it matches the the passion that you hear a in the lyrics and b in the piano yeah exactly i think there's there's a nice um conversation between his vocals and the piano isn't it um if if you listen to uh, another two of his songs i think it's i'm on fire and breathless they use the same formula as as great balls of fire it's the same the same sort of like uh up tempo rock groove and with stops before the the the, the main line of the chorus and that kind of stuff uh, but he was really really good at using that formula and creating on top of that and uh, uh yeah but the vocals are essential so he wouldn't be that famous if it was just for his piano playing i think that yeah. his vocals are quite recognizable as well isn't it so he was clearly also not trying to sound like anyone else that's the other thing uh, yeah and, and he just has this freedom with it doesn't he where you know i've got in my notes here funny voices but i'm talking about those moments <laughs> where he's like you know kiss me baby it feels good you yeah. know just playing around he's having fun and this is what rock and roll was about wasn't it it was about yeah, energy. yeah. it was about changing the norms not doing something that was so normal before you know when you think about pop music in the 40s and 50s you think of sort of show music um musical yeah. theater show music that was on broadway and you have a very cons again i'm generalizing here but you'd have a very conservative singer probably singing very conservative lyrics as well in a very normal and i don't want to go as far as saying like operatic way but it would be very controlled nice notes nice melodies but then you've got jerry lee lewis coming here you know we, yeah. we mentioned it in the elvis episode with some of his uh vocal ways like you know i want to see you like that 
This yeah. is a bit different because Elvis was kind of, it was more of a rhythmic thing. This is just a guy going off on one and doing whatever he wants, whatever he thinks the song needs. And it's yeah, brilliant. It's, it sounds like he would go into a recording session and, and, and play as if he's playing in his living room. Yeah. You know, so it's just like, yeah, I'd sort of, you know, mess about with the lyrics and, and the melody. And, and he laughs sometimes in the middle of the melody. Yep. But there's a version, I think it's his first recording of uh, a Big Leg Woman. I don't want to get all in any of the, the song titles wrong, uh, but it's it's uh, it's in the movie. It's a famous song, but it is his uh, original recording for Sun, um, uh, Sun Records was um, he, he just he, he's just like clearly uh, uh, interacting with his own piano. He's like yeah. having fun with himself, you know, like plays a phrase on the piano and kind of does the same with the vocals. And he's almost like laughing as he sings the lyrics. He's not taking him, himself very seriously there. Through, and it's super yeah. fun to listen to. It. Through fun. all these songs, there's shouting, there's laughing, there's growling. Like he just does it all. He's just having yeah. fun. And I think that's what's really yeah. important and probably quite innovative because although we, like I said, we heard those vocal things, Elvis did it. Little Richard as well changed his voice depending on what the song needed. There was still an element of, I'm going to say seriousness there. It feels like although they were messing about a bit in terms of vocal flexions and this and that, they still had to deliver the melody. And that's because probably they were writing, they were recording songs for their labels and for studios. Yeah. And yeah. obviously Jerry Lee Lewis might have been doing the same, but I just love that. I, I, I'd love to think that they're in the studio and whoever the producer is just goes jerry do what the hell you want man because yeah. because what we know what you're good at and if you record it and execute it well it's going to sell and yeah, it did exactly it, it, it did. did multiple times isn't yeah it? yeah exactly um yeah as i said this is a very yeah the, my notes i got departure from more polished and restrained pop performances of the era which as i was saying the move from the 40s and early 50s pop into this rebellious and crazy rock and roll yeah. brings us to where we are with his vocals um now the other thing we talk about especially in this song um is the lyrics because this again was a very innovative and unusual lyrical style very sexual very um rebellious you know this is not one this is not what parents of the 50s wanted their teenage kids listening to, especially yeah. back then in such a conservative time. Because it does remind me of Little Richard in that sense, isn't it? The lyrics. Yeah, are although I feel that this almost... is a bit more explicit than Little Richard. Yeah. To, to a degree. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, as I said, yeah, con controversial at the time. But this, the explicitness, we have to look back at this as the mo or as not as one of the moments that revolutionized early rock and roll. Yeah. Because exactly. this is what this is what rock for those who don't know this is what rock and roll means. Rock and roll literally means sex, rocking yeah. and rolling in a bed on a sofa, whatever. Yeah, that's the that's, that's where the literal. And he wasn't of the trying to. He, yeah, he wasn't trying to avoid this. You know the the you know talking about this sort of stuff and um, it, also the the fact he he would call himself the wild one. You know, he's he's, <laughs> yeah. he's wild. He's he's he he wanted to be the king of rock and roll. He wanted to be bigger than Elvis, and his yeah. performance is all about that. It's funny because when we think about like uh, um, any music from that time, you, you tend to think of the way you look at the way people dressed at the time. You would imagine a certain behavior, uh, like kind of um, attached to that image, yeah. and it doesn't happen with him. I think he was almost like a Jimi Hendrix on stage, and you know? uh, although he never set fire on the piano, like happens in a movie, <laughs> and a people, a people, yeah, I don't think it's even possible to set fire on the piano and keep playing. Um, but um, <laughs> but uh, he, he was kind of like really close to that sort of a, a Jimi Hendrix attitude on stage. Yeah. But you would imagine you, we see those things with guitarists right all the time, like breaking guitars or or jumping and doing all the stuff you would imagine that someone who is uh, uh you know sitting in front of his uh, piano is like you're restricted to that like the the you know the the piano is almost like a, a, a an obstacle between you and and, and your audience and it's and he performs yeah, that's a in great a way, point <laughs> yeah you know it's like it's not it's not like a guitar you can walk around on stage with it and he could perform with his piano as if he was a, a heavy metal guitar player well, that's a great way. point, and I, I I would go as far as to say that probably Little Richard, um, Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis is is one of the reasons that we saw um the Who smashing up the the yeah. their guitars on stage, you know, um yeah. Keith Moon kicking his kit, you know, this is where because it's rock and roll, yeah. and although the Who were like, well, actually, do you know, we're thinking about it, the Who were only sort of ten or fifteen years after this, 
you can see exactly where they got this out. They, they must have looked at Jerry Lee Lewis and gone, my God, this guy thinks he can do what he wants. And he yeah. can, and he yeah, can, exactly. so we can do it as well. This And this is what we're going to bring to our music. We're going to take that, that, that bass of the blues and we're going to add, add distorted guitars, add a bit of raucousness, add some shouting and transform yeah, it into I, like I, rock and roll. Yeah, I think a proper like rock and roll performer would all, always get some sort of reaction from the audience. And it, it might be because the music is amazing, but sometimes it's just because it's shocking. In yeah. a certain way, and uh, to quote Spinal Tap again, uh, "Rock and roll should change your life, not necessarily for the better." <laughs> so we're not we're not saying that if you listen to Jerry Lee Lewis and if you you know read about him, you're gonna you're gonna feel any better. On the contrary, yeah. But the thing is, it's it's that's rock and roll. Uh, it does rock and roll is not always cool, is not always good, isn't it? I, I feel bad for forgetting the quote, but is it? Is it the same movie where they? Is, does he say it's good, the, good it's rock reunion, and roll? It's final tap reunion. He says like good rock and roll should, should hurt. hurt. Yeah, it should change your life, not <laughs> necessarily not for the better. For the better. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah so yeah, generally the, uh, the last couple of days listening to his music, he's changed my life, but not not quite sure. It's for yeah. the better. No, no. <laughs> uh, and the final point about Great Balls of Fire, which is a fantastic song, um, it's just the short, punchy structure, which became like a, a symbol and a hallmark for him and his kind of music. It's like it was so fast, it was so intense that it's like two minutes, just get it done. Yeah, and the first line is just vocals, isn't it? And yep. then on the piano and the band respond to the vocals, like a call and response with vocals and the band. Yeah. And it's really intense. Yeah, really short. The the, the the 1989 version of it is longer with a guitar solo, but I prefer the original, which is really punchy and yeah. short. And, and like, you know, I, I think you, you've just got to think that it definitely ensured its suitability for 50s radio because yeah. you think now that even nowadays what what we're saying you can't really have a song shorter than uh, longer than four minutes that get radio play yeah because people's yeah. attention spans just aren't up yeah. then they're not up for it but yeah. to think about it back then you know radio was probably quite a limited amount of time you had to either listen to the radio or to sort yeah. of you know go through songs and hear your favorites and just thinking that you know a one one and one minute 50 second song which a lot of his were just gets it done you know yeah, probably exactly. suits, suits a teenage audience which he was what he was going for Exactly, and it's perfect for the dance floor. It's perfect for a live gig. It's perfect for radio. It's just it's, it's a yeah. song that works in pretty much any situation. Also, you could be that's that's an interesting thing. If you go to 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 like a local gig and there's a pop show, uh, the the band could play that song. If it's a classic rock show, they could play that song. If yeah. it's a country show, they could play that song. And if it's a blues show, they can play that song. That's a great that song point. would be in any sort of live music scenario and would get everyone up and dancing. Fantastic point, yeah. And, and I think the, the fact that we don't really dwell on anything too long, it's not too long of the vocals and it's not too long of yeah. a piano solo. It just keeps, keeps like you said, keeps the audience and the listeners entertained and engaged yeah um so yeah we've that that's that's what we've got to say about great balls of fire um let's sort of expand a bit more and talk about some of the other songs so yeah. you know as, as i said to listeners and viewers the, the songs are in the playlist we've got songs like high school confidential i'm on fire whole lot of shaking breathless crazy arms wild one lucky old son um chantilly lace you win again mean woman blues these are the kind of songs that we've looked at and identified as sort of being his hits and his most famous songs. And we just sort of had a little listen to them and sort of took a look at what was very innovative, pioneering and what the general characteristics were. One thing that I want to talk about first, and you mentioned it, was the country music. Because yeah. in his, he made a transition to country music in the 60s. And I think what's funny is the way he approached it he took the aspects of what was best about his music and he kind of intertwined it into a country sounding thing, didn't he? And it <laughs> yeah. made it relevant. He made rock and roll and his transition into country, he made it seamless. He didn't just go from a rock and roll artist to a country artist. He took what worked about his style and he moved it over with him to the country. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and he had a, a country music influence. He recorded Crazy Arms, isn't it? Which is a, a country song. I think the original, I don't know who, who 
Uh, the original one is by Kenny Brown, I guess. No, he listened to Kenny Brown. I don't know, I don't know if that's the original one. Uh, but I've I've listened to Ray Price uh, version, which was the first time I've listened to that song. Mm -hmm. And it's told like it's proper country with the fiddle and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so if you listen to Ray Price's version of Crazy Arms and it's like, OK, that's country. And then you listen to 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 Jerry Lewis, like he turned into something else. But the energy is there and, and, and his his musical identity is there in a way that he made the song his own song which is that's absolutely song. right and he transferred that rebellious yeah. energy into country which was yeah. in, it which was an innovation in and of itself yeah because you know country music was quite run of the mill you know like i said we got that 40s and 50s pop music you got your jazz you got your rhythm and blues and country was always a staple uh, in america uh, so yeah, I mean, if you want to hear some of his country stuff, check out songs like What Made Milwaukee Famous, uh, She Even Woke Me Up To Say Goodbye. There was one other one that I put in the playlist. Uh, you Win Again was very country. And that, that's literally from an album called A Taste of Country. So there you go. Um, that was interesting. But in terms of the, the cross genre stuff as well, because he, he, he made the very clear move over to country in the 60s. Yeah. But even in his early music, we got a little blend of genres, didn't we? And this is what we said. This is what... I, I, when, when I was doing my research and doing the notes, I would just found myself thinking, oh, I wrote this exact same thing for Fats Domino, or I wrote this exact same thing for Elvis. And this is the reason why these guys are the pioneers of rock and roll, because yeah. they dared to be different. They dared to uh, cross genres. And just like Elvis and Little Richard and Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley and Fats Domino, we get a mixture of these genres. We get boogie woogie, we get gospel, we get blues, we get R&B. You know, um, his, but those, those guys grew up listening to all of that. I think in yeah. the end, for them, that's just music. That's yeah, they like, don't see it differently. Do yeah, they? I don't. I don't think it's, there's a lot of um, um, planning into this. I need to make this more boogie woogie. Yeah, boogie, or, like I need to make this more country. I think they were like, okay, I grew up listening to that kind of stuff. I'm gonna play in my own way. Yeah, uh, and I think yeah, and. Um, and I think good good songs, you know, Great Balls of Fire is one of them because you've got that boogie-woogie piano, the blues, harmonic progression. Yeah. Um, a whole lot of shaking going on is another good one. A whole lot of shaking is one of my personal favourite songs to play live. You know, oh, you play you, can, you must. Yeah, of course, uh, you play with your yeah, band. Yeah, I play that in yeah, some of the blues gigs and, and stuff because you people people learn the chorus on the go. If they've never heard that song, like shake baby shake it's just that. <laughs> you, you can Anyone can sing that. Yeah. Anyone can learn the lyrics on the spot. And and you get people repeating that chorus for as long as you want, and it's super fun to 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 see an audience interacting with the, with the song. Some of them might not be familiar with the song. I, I, I mean, it's famous enough for most people to know it, but mm. it's it's a phenomenal. Uh, his version of it is a phenomenal uh, take on the song, and it's it's yeah. just yeah, it's one of those like it's it's kind of a dance music in a way isn't it oh for the time for sure <laughs> yeah. yeah but what what this genre did blending did is it just made rock and roll more inclusive it, it basically in terms of audiences who liked gospel could come and listen to it maybe not jerry Lee lewis maybe that's maybe that's a bit extreme of the rock and roll but you know <laughs> they'd go and they'd listen to fats domino wouldn't they um and it appealed to fans of other music genres as well uh, yeah. and you know especially that the, the a key cornerstone of rock and roll music was the bringing together of black and white music and again if you've heard this before it's because we've said it before with elvis with fats domino it was such a significant genre it was so important rock and roll and just to see another example of one of the pioneers um but let's do something else he did he, he was very innovative for and something that actually i don't think we can say the same for elvis fats or any of the others yeah or not to this extent anyway his high energy performances yeah. Go on, talk to us about that, his stage well, presence and everything. Well, the thought, well, you have a nice picture uh, just uh, uh, behind you. Well, actually, here, no, 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 background. no, no, I don't. Look, I'm going to turn my video off because mm. he's on the piano. Oops. Yeah, exactly. Oh, no, let, let me do it like one. this. Yeah, Look, that's he's on the, the piano. One. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. Like, uh, I've got a, a picture of him on my background here, like playing with his left foot on the piano. Uh, so he would play with his feet. He would sit on the piano. And he would like, uh, uh, you know, literally, literally play with his ass, you know, <laughs> and play. And, and it's, it's just, it's just, again, it's over the top, but it makes you laugh. You know, yeah. the, 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 the energy is like, it's almost for me, it sounds to me like he was angry and happy at the same time. Yeah. It's that kind of performance. It, it, it feels like he wants to break everything on stage. I feel like he was happy that he was on stage, but he was probably getting his anger out 
Yeah, and that's what exactly. he was doing. Um, but yeah, you know, this raw, rebellious stage presence really did set a standard for showmanship yeah. that we'd never seen before. You know, influencing Elvis, you know, to do his little dancing. And you, I mean, as we said, you know, think of numerous. Uh, there's too many to list of, of artists who are smashing their instruments, who are doing yeah. crazy stuff. You know, Hendrix playing behind the thing. I yeah. don't think Hendrix would do that if he didn't see Jerry Lee Lewis playing the piano exactly. with his feet. Yeah. Do you think the piano? Maybe actually, I was gonna. I was gonna ask. Do you think the piano limited Jerry Lee Lewis? But actually, the answer is it's probably good because it, if he did yeah, have a guitar, good. it would be God crazier. knows what that man would do without <laughs> yeah. without the piano as Being a shoe established on the floor. The piano is yeah. like a shoe for the audience, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he was oh. he was he was wild. But I think yeah, it's interesting though. Like if, if it wasn't for the piano, because like he would like just you know, as as in the picture you have there he would like uh, uh, stand on top of the piano and sing and walk around but eventually he had to go back to his stool and actually play yeah, yeah. so that kind of stuff uh, i think it's it's an interesting limitation and made the performance quite unique uh when you think about um if you compare him to fats domino it's like it's the opposite in in a way you know fats domino is like the you know that 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 good good man that you want you want to you want him to be around you you want him to come to your family dinner and play the piano in the living room is super cool relaxed and he was always there with a smile on his face mm. whilst Jerry Lewis is like an angry version of 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 the same sort of music in in a way yeah. I want I want to mention one of his songs or of one course. of the, the the songs he recorded which shows uh, a complete different side. Of his personality or, his, or of his music musical yep. personality is the uh, the song that lucky old son, yes. uh, which is a ballad, really beautiful ballad, and yep. uh, it has been recorded by some of the biggest names in the music industry. So Ray Charles, Sam Cooke, Tom Jones, Louis Armstrong, Johnny Cash. So everyone, Johnny Cash was later on, I guess, uh, but everyone has recorded that song, but his version of it. Um, I actually, for some reason, I prefer the 1989, the movie soundtrack version of it. Okay. Maybe because the recording is better, I don't know. But his take on that song is, it's completely different because all those big names, they recorded with a full band, orchestra, you know, big production for uh, uh, the standards of the time. Yeah. And Jerry Lewis plays this song on his own. And it's just him and the piano. And what he does with the piano, it's beyond beautiful it's just it's uh his amazing piano skills are there yeah uh, it's, it's it's not about the technique it's about the uh it's about the expression the and feeling it, and, and, yeah. yeah the feeling and it makes that song makes you sad but makes you want to listen to it again and again so mm. i've listened to that song four times today so mm. to give an idea yeah. It, yeah so i totally if you if you don't know this song you can listen to the other ones you can compare to all the other uh, guys because the problem with those artists at the time is they all recorded the same songs a yeah, lot of those exactly guys. yeah yeah so it's really hard to stand out with something that's not your own music like great balls of fire that's his song now that lucky old son it's not his song and some really really big names have recorded it but i think he did better mm. no it's yeah yeah no, i agree it's, it's a fantastic take on it um well yeah i mean suppose that's it for his his innovations and pioneering in the in the world of music uh we what do we, we were talking about his, his performance yeah i was just going to say that i feel like when you in, in terms of like word association mm. you think rock star okay no not jerry yeah. lewis i'm just saying the yeah, words rock, rock star. star the next words to come i think are rock and roll yeah and i think people i, I was gonna say people like jerry lee lewis i'm gonna i'm gonna be a bit dramatic here i think jerry lee lewis might be the reason that you look at something and say that's rock and roll because mm. for all elvis did his dancing and the crazy stuff it wasn't rock star attitude was it in the early days yeah for all fat domino did it wasn't a rock star attitude for all little richard did although he performed well and he had this kind of mysterious <coughs> excuse me and he had this sort of mysterious aura about him it none of them at least to the level of Jerry Lee Lewis, exude that I'm untouchable, I'm a rock star attitude. Would you I agree? I think it was, yeah, because I think he, he can be compared to, uh, in terms of his uh, stage persona and all that stuff, uh, uh, as 
uh, compared to Axl Rose, for instance. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's that same level of rock and roll attitude, and I mean the bad side of it. <laughs> yeah, but in, exactly, in, yeah. in 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 1950s or late 1950s and 60s, you know. So it's uh, uh, actually it's not. When when was his first album uh, released? So his first EP was in 52. Yeah. Yeah, so early fifties, yeah. actually. Yeah, but then it was, so, only, it was so about had, it was the he, later fifties yeah. where he started recording at studios and stuff. So yeah, so so the, the kind of like um, a rock and roll or rock star image that you see uh, in bands in in the eighties, you know, the hard rock and glam rock bands in the eighties, he had yeah. that back in the day. I'm not, I'm, I'm by no means I'm saying this is a good thing because I think I, I'm still more interested in the music than anything else. You know, like I, I still. Uh, um, I, I love music for for the sort of emotions that the melodies and the lyrics bring to me. I, I don't care about you know that much about uh, personalities and, and 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 you know uh, lifestyles and all that stuff. But his stage uh, uh, attitude was um, a bit too much, and and that actually defined what rock and roll or what being a rock star is, I guess. Because yeah. I think he was trying too hard to be the king of rock and roll. You do, I think he was. Wait, uh, I think he wanted to be bigger than Elvis and bigger than ever, everyone else. I might be mm. wrong about it. It's just, well, so. let's talk now about why he wasn't, and this is a, a, a sort of a difficult segment to touch because there's some distressing themes here. Uh, but the controversy and decline of Jerry Lee Lewis's career. Now, there's a myriad of things that we we you know we have to address. First of all, he had very bad habits of drug and alcohol abuse. Um, I mean, he had seven wives and six children with, you know, various of those seven wives. Um, and within those wives, there were accusations of violence from previous marriages. Um, on top of his bad habits of drug and alcohol abuse, you also had him spending copious amounts of money that he'd earned fairly, but on habits and a lifestyle that wasn't sustainable. Mm -hmm. So, and again, this might be another, another little tick in the rock star box. Yes, yeah. spending and money, getting married to multiple women, being and I'm not accusing all rock stars of being violent, but you know what I mean. It's the kind of a, an association that a rock star I, is wild, and I don't want to say every rock star is a domestic abuser, but in this case, I think you know, is is the 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 um idea that fame and money allows you to do whatever you think it, you, whatever comes to your mind. Yeah. So so I think when people have a lot of money, a lot of fame, they they have access to 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 certain things that most people don't yeah. have also they they have people telling them all day how great they are they start to believe in that and they start yeah. behaving away i think i think uh, uh, um if you have too much money it, you will show you're probably going to show to the world who you really are mm. and that's the thing and you know, good people with a lot of money can do a lot of good things and bad yeah. bad people with, with a lot, lot of money, money yeah. can do a lot of bad things so, so but the 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 effectively the day the uh because i think you can actually tie it to one specific week where one jerry, event one event where jerry lee lewis's career began to decline was came in 1958 where it was revealed that he married his 13 one three 13 year old cousin myra brown uh jerry lee lewis was 22 at the time and in her words uh, i just want to get it right in her words it was not seen as unusual in the southern culture they came from but it, to the rest of the world it, does, it, it was doesn't an outrage. make it right it not at all right, but it? to the rest of the world i mean it was literally an international scandal uh, yeah. You did a bit of research into what happened in Britain. Oh, well, yeah, day, well, yeah, exactly. So ba basically, uh, it was, uh, I don't remember the name of the journalist, it was a UK journalist who who actually published this to the world. Because it might have been the case that people didn't look into it in America or didn't care about it or whatever. I don't know the reason for it. But it was when he was touring uh, the UK that the media put it out uh, and basically say, you know, this is this is what rock and roll is, this kind of bad attitude. He's a bad man. Look at what, what he's doing. And she's just a baby. They put all the, all that kind of stuff. So they, they really wanted to to shock because it is shocking. So the thing is, like, yeah. basically, basically, he didn't... Um, I don't think he could find a way out of this because it's like uh, uh, he married her and he, I think she was with him uh, in England. Uh, she was with him when... When the media figure ever, figure everything out, and I think they lied about her age as well. So he did. He tried to get away, saying she was a couple of years older, whatever. Right. And uh, yeah, so the, the, his official statements about her, her age were 
were not real. So that's the other thing. So it was yeah. lying, just like lying about it so as well. The, the so basically, were... try to but oh, you know, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. So just trying to justify something that that's not acceptable. Mm. And whether or not something is acceptable in your own culture does not make it okay to the rest of the world. Well, it, yeah, it doesn't and mean doesn't mean that people are going to see it as as a good exactly. thing. You know? Exactly. Yeah. And literally, you got your three things. You got the lying. She was yeah. thirteen and um a, a cousin as well so yeah. those three things all came together and literally overnight uh it came during his promotional tour in england he was blacklisted from radio stations the tour was cancelled after three shows his sales in the uk and actually quite interestingly in the us plummeted yeah. radio stations refused to play his songs and this once promising career that had only been going for a couple of years yeah just plummeted yeah was so, that was that the first cancellation in the history of pop culture? Probably you, not. You you were saying about this before we started recording. Did do you have evidence? Did, did you read? No, the no, thing no. Else? I'm just I'm just asking. No, oh, it's like because wow, right. the le the level of uh, 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 like uh, uh, how can I put it the um, the amount of stuff that happened to him as a consequence of his his bad actions and bad yeah. choices. Uh, it's 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 it's. Probably I don't quite know unique if it was, for the time. Yeah, for the time. I don't for think anyone suffered that kind of uh, consequences for. So, was 1958 the first occurrence of cancel culture? Well, could have been. So, <laughs> there we you can, go. You is that know. the beginning of cancel culture? That's the thing, <laughs> there you know. We go. Jerry Lee is a pioneer in, in many ways for the. <laughs> we didn't consider that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So unfortunately, I say unfortunately. You know, it's hard because you look at him as, and what he's done and what he's done for music and you say, well, you know, it's a shame that he didn't go on and do more with music because who knows what he would have done. But at the same time, you kind of look at the situation and you say, well, it's not really on. Is I think, it? I so, think it's, yeah, I think you, you can separate the artists from, from, or not the artists, I say the music from the from artists the actions, in, a, yeah. in, uh, in a certain way, but I think there's limits to it. I think most people don't care that much uh, about, uh, uh, what someone does in, in their private life, and as long as the performance is good, but when when your actions affect the life of someone else who is innocent or or you know can't protect mm. themselves or whatever, vulnerable, so that's that's yeah. yeah any vulnerable yeah when your bad choices affect any vulnerable person, I think that's when people cross the line. I would say, yeah. oh, or, and maybe that's where the audience says, you know what, I don't, I don't want to go to your gig, I don't want to give you my money, yeah. which which is which is understandable, mm -hmm. uh, but in a way. Uh, in a way, um, it was a, probably a lesson for 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 the industry of music as well, for for musicians and, and everyone else. Yeah, that's Not a that great people, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a know. great point. I mean, I suppose when you look at it now, that's actually a very good point because when you look at it now, look at the latest outrage that's happened in rock and roll. Yeah. Dave Grohl yeah. um, has was has cheated on his wife, and he's got another woman pregnant, uh, and he's come out and admitted it, and he said. Um, I've made a mistake, uh, but I'm going to be there for the child. I'm going to support the child and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And he has been cancelled to holy hell. Like people don't want to hear Dave Grohl anymore because yeah, he's done I, this I horrible I found that action. one particularly, particularly but funny because he I was just saying it's interesting. Guy, it's interesting yeah. how, it, you know, between 58 yeah. and 2024, 58, that's the worst thing you could do. Marry your 13 year old cousin, have kids and she, you know, whatever. 2024, the worst thing you can do is cheat on your wife. Yeah. So I kind of like that our standards have gotten better as the years have gone on, but at the same in this, time, in I mean, the sense that we try not to accept some bad behavior. Yes, I found, I found funny the um, interesting that you bring the Dave Grohl uh, story uh, uh, because it's I found quite funny that normally he doesn't talk that much about his personal life, isn't it? Yeah, and he came out to say, you know, he he gave the news himself, and I found funny that in a certain way, I was just like Dave. Sorry, I don't want to hear about your your private life. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think what that's happened. The, you know, sorry, go on. Yeah, because it's not like it's not like you got arrested because you 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 beating someone up or yeah. whatever. It's something bad that you didn't affect you and your family, and I don't want to know. So, it's like, but I, I just have a feeling. Yeah. And I said this to my wife because we're we're both big Foo Fighters fans. I have a feeling that something might have come out if he didn't. I don't want to say that the lady yeah. who he gave a child to was gonna threat. Oh, you know, Dave, yeah. if you don't if you don't support me, I'm gonna yeah, come or, out and or tell maybe the media. he preferred to say it before I know everyone else yeah, starts I think talking he just, about it. Yeah. I think he just wanted to get ahead of it. I'll you know, Foo Fighters are one of the biggest bands in the world. I'm sure their PR team they 
yeah. they pay him a lot. Probably just wanted to get ahead of it. But I agree with you. No, it's it, interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's interesting. No, one thing uh, I think it's the first time we're touching the uh, celebrity gossip kind of a, okay. uh, <laughs> kind of uh, show, isn't it? Wow, the Jerry maybe, Lewis episode. Maybe, How yeah, odd. maybe we're gonna yeah, maybe we're gonna change the style completely <laughs> from now on. Uh, but I just want to say, um, no, it's interesting. Like. Uh, um, how when you watch a movie, right, and there is a let's say, do you know what? One of my favorite movies, The Godfather, right? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's it's clear to me that although they want you to kind of fall in love with the characters, they're not trying by any means to say that those people are good. So I think the best films do that. Yeah, and you I know, when, I, when you think, sorry, just related to that, my favorite TV show is The Sopranos. Right, and which is based the, on that kind of... Well, it's, it's gangster stuff. And the whole yeah. point of The Sopranos is that Tony Soprano is stuck always throughout the whole series. He's stuck between decisions that's yeah. going to affect his family, his gang. And none of the decisions he ever makes are morally right. Yeah. But the other decision, he ha the other choice he had would have been even worse. Yeah. So yeah, exactly, and, and I would I would say like with uh, with most of the rock stars, they they probably most of them had opportunities to 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 do much better things in their lives. But uh, 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 what I believe is like when you see those people acting and living like that, uh, you can still admire their music first of all because that's something else. Um, it's like it's like if someone is an, is an exceptional like a uh, footballer, but they you know, horrible people. You you can't say they're not good in football. Yeah, so their job. Like, yeah. it's it's not it's not it's a it's an objective fact that Jerry Lewis is a phenomenal musician. That's that's that that's measurable in many ways, right? Mm. Now, uh, but but the 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 thing for me is like when you see you know everything that comes out in the press about rock stars about or the the, the how controversial they are and this and that. That means I think it's interesting to see how people behave when when they have that that sort of power or that sort of money, and it's uh, there's lots of lessons to learn from that. And I don't think uh, following the stories and trying to understand what happened means that uh, we're turning those guys into heroes, right? I think they are at the same time heroes, heroes and villains in their own stories. And you have to remember, you know, Dave Grohl is not the first person to ever cheat on his wife. He is only yeah, exactly. human. You know, exactly. so I think, you know, I came away with it and myself and, and Dash, we just kind of like, well, listen, it sucks because we, we look up to him. He's a bit of a rock icon, a bit of a rock god. He's, he's fucked up a bit here. Yeah, um, but, do, but do we're not going to look at look Foo up Fighters up, any differently, you know? Yeah, the, does it treat his audience badly or does it do it like, does it does it commit crimes and stuff like that? Yeah. So that's the point. For me, for me, the whole thing is like, uh, um, I can go to a gig and enjoy a performance as long as the artist is not behaving like a dickhead to the audience, right? Yeah. Uh, and and I don't want to know what those guys, uh, as as long as they're not criminals, I don't want to know what those guys are doing behind the scenes. Yeah. And That's for me, the, the problem with Jerry Lewis, I would say, is that he crossed that line uh, and uh, for, you know, is it a crime? You mm. know, pro, you know, in, in many ways it is a crime. Yeah. So, so that's 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 the that's the line. But yeah. I would say, like in in general, like uh, like the Dave Grohl story, I didn't even bother reading no. about it. It's like you know, it's like I uh, I like his music. I I, yeah. I don't want to know his opinions. I don't want to know about his life. Jeremy yeah. Lewis, though, he was so uh, out there. He was so like outrageous, uh, uh, outrageous that I think he he couldn't hide his his uh, most uh, evil side. Mm. You know, well. Yeah, let's leave the, the controversy and the decline and the bad stuff yeah. behind and let's just touch on his legacy before we finish. So we've yeah. pretty much said it throughout the whole episode, but when you think Jerry Lee Lewis, you think of the iconic rebellious performances that really defined early rock and roll, that gave rock and roll that rebellious tag that had the sexual yeah. lyrics that kind of towed the line of, oh, is this acceptable? Is it not? Um, his messages his musical messages resonated with the youth culture of the time and really, really just set a standard and set the tone for rock music that followed. Because when you think only 10 years later, you've got yeah. Zeppelin one coming out yeah. or the who, you know, and you think, God, yeah. when you think that to me is crazy because I've always, one thing that I've always struggled with, I say struggled with is I look at, at all the Beatles did in eight years. Yeah. And I think, God, like some of my, my favorite movie, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, came out in 1975. Mm -hmm. The Beatles oh. had been disbanded for five years. Yeah. 
Wow. <laughs> and it's, I just think, how can they have not existed at the same time? And it's kind of like this. It, it's baffled me just now doing that quick maths that Zeppelin only came 10 or so years after Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah. I, it's you know crazy makes, when yeah, I think yeah, Do you know what it. makes me, yeah, what, what makes me sad about music, uh, mostly, I, I'm going to sound like an old man now. <laughs> In my well, day. I am, I, I am an old man anyway. <laughs> but what I'm saying is like, um, I, I have a feeling that music now is so predictable in many ways. You know, it's like you listen to stuff and say, oh, that sounds like that. Sounds like some, someone else. Oh, I guess we're and getting a key think, change think, in the next chorus. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and, and from, from the, the recordings to, to the stage performances, uh, what people who have achieved in the 50s 60s and 70s is still like uh um, mind-blowing I yeah think. it sounds to me like hundreds of years of music history in those yeah. three decades i wonder what in 50 years they'll be saying about the 2020s and i'm serious like i wonder if something yeah. innovative has maybe an album was released this week from an artist we don't know about from a genre we don't listen to and maybe something yeah. was really innovative about it but we won't yeah. know until maybe 30 years from now where they look back exactly. and go that was the moment that this happened but yeah <laughs> anyway with jerry lee lewis the same thing you know the influence on the artists you know just from his attitude you can tell he influenced punk musicians rock musicians oh, i yeah. go as far as saying heavy metal uh the raw energy in his piano based singer songwriter thing you've got to look at people like elton john billy joel little richard just yeah. you know sitting down at a piano and playing your music the way you want, yeah. not sort of just standing at a microphone covering a song. You're in charge of making the music as well, which I thought was important. Is, is it, I think maybe what it does is as close to heavy rock as it can possibly be For having the, the piano, having yeah. the piano as the main instrument. I oh, think. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know what I mean? You, yeah. can make, you can make heavy rock with guitars, but having the piano as the, the leading instrument is really difficult. Yeah. Anyway, anything else to say? Should we wrap it up? I just listen to it. To yeah. <laughs> we always gonna, hear like I'm preaching. Just stamp You've got to go and listen to it. I'm just going to stamp that on yeah. Felipe's screen every time. I uh, say anything, say Felipe. Just listen to it. Just listen. Um, That's like the night uh, thing. Just do it. Just listen yeah, to just it. Yeah, just do it. Just do it. Just listen. <laughs> listen to rock and roll. One day I will make a Nike tick with your beard <laughs> on it or something. And I'll say, just listen to it. <laughs> but, I, I, but I'll say, okay. Um, I will say... Um, Something that I've learned from from Andy, my good friend Andy, who's a guitar player. I uh, says, Jerry Lewis, listen to him. Don't look him up. Don't look him up. <laughs> <laughs> listen to his music. It's great. <laughs> Well, yeah, thank you for joining us, guys, on another episode. We had to look him up because we had to do the research yeah. and we had to do but it for you guys. Do yeah, Just you guys, we, we've given you the highlights. Don't go and read anymore if you don't mm. want to know the bad stuff. Um, but anyway, we thank you for joining us for another episode of the Long Live Rock and Roll podcast. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit like and subscribe so you can see when our new videos come out. If you're listening to us on Apple and Spotify, do us a favor, scroll down, give us a little review, tap the five stars, and it's going to do the world of good for us because we go up the charts and people will see us more often. So thank you again for joining. Thanks for being with us one more time. Keep on rocking, everyone. And don't do anything Jerry Lewis will do. <laughs> so I had to end in a different way today. You have, <laughs> you have completely thrown me off. I was not expecting that. But actually, that could not be a more perfect line to the ep and, and to, uh, That could not be a more perfect Felipe line to end the episode. Yes, oh, sorry. Jesus Christ. Anyway, <laughs> on that note, take care, guys, and long live rock and roll. <laughs> Seriously, see you later. Long live rock and roll. <laughs> see you, guys. Thank you. <laughs>